Mr. Otto Scott's accomplishments as a publicist, an editor, a business executive, and as a journalist are well documented. Um, perhaps, uh, however, one thing that you don't particularly appreciate, some of you that don't subscribe to the Easy Chair tapes and to the tapes that come weekly from Calcedon, are his cogent remarks and questions following the preaching service by Reverend Rushton at Calcedon. Our group in Beaverton has benefited greatly from his insights, of course, as well as the teaching of Reverend Rushton as he goes through various books of the Bible. It's important to understand that Otto Scott is important to the Christian Church for many reasons, and historical emphasis is one of them, historical accuracy is one of them. Additionally, however, uh, Otto Scott has a well-developed uh, sense of the sovereignty of God in history. I think one of the high points for myself of the conference two years ago was when Otto took us through a series of uh, critiques and analysis of all the problems that beset the Christian Church and our society in America today, and when we were all at the point of despair, he said the only thing that we had going for us was God. Tremendously uplifting point of the, of the conference for myself. <laughs> Otto is extremely important to the Christian Church, and it's my privilege to introduce him. And I just uh, exhort you strongly to listen hard to what he has to say, and I think you'll be greatly profited by it. Mr. Scott? <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Marvelous introduction. Every word of it true, of course. <laughs> a few years back, I asked a very well-known journalist to speak on this topic, and he refused, saying that there is no Christianity in the media. <laughs> Now, that is, generally speaking, true, but that's the story. The lack of respect for Christianity and Christians in the American media is obvious and demands analysis. And analysis, however, this should not consist simply of denunciation. History indicates that shotgun charges of prejudice and discrimination simply sow the seeds of dissension and tend to worsen the situation. Public charges and sanctions can drive prejudice underground, and it can erupt later with even greater force. Analysis, on the other hand, seeks to dispassionately discover when a long-standing situation began to change, when it gained momentum, why it becomes fashionable, to whom it appeals, and why it attains dominance. It's our task, and one that we shall not complete today, to trace the manner in which the American media came to believe that the religion of the majority of Americans no longer deserved respectful coverage or comment. In the interest of time, I'll confine this partial analysis to this century, which opened in 1901, during a high tide of American optimism. Now, that's not to say that Christianity was not in trouble here. In common with Britain, France, and Germany, we were burdened by intellectuals who had broken with the faith and who had adopted the idolatry of the great god science. The great God science would presumably plan a perfect heaven on earth for everyone by using the powers of government to perfect society. But in general, Christianity retained a public position difficult for us today to visualize. Newspapers regularly carried the substance of sermons by outstanding ministers on the front pages on Sunday and Monday. The clergy was regularly consulted and quoted on public issues. The respectable middle class considered it mandatory to attend regular church services and to support their churches. Insults to Christianity were neither condoned nor ignored and could result in social, political, and financial ruin for those who violated such sanctions. 
It should be noticed, however, that the Christian culture in the United States from 1900 to 1917 was mainly dominated by the Protestant churches, although the Roman Catholics were a very large minority. Throughout the 19th century in the United States, especially from the middle to the latter end of the century, these two main branches of Christianity had contended against one another on several cultural levels, educational, social, and political. But by the turn of the century, these collisions had greatly diminished a sort of Christian cultural consensus had been achieved, which in large measure continued the manners and much of the outlook of the late Victorians. And this situation remained in force from 1900 to about 1917, when it was ended by World War I. Now, when we discuss the media in this context, most historians concentrate upon the press upon books and magazines, and to a larger extent, to a certain extent, newspapers. And they place newspapers last, because these have, in modern times, served as much to entertain as to inform. Their accuracy through the years has been so erratic that no serious scholars use them as sources for anything excepting as barometers of propaganda. No historian denies that newspapers at one time played a major part in shaping public opinion, but they are not the only such vehicles. Shortly after the turn of the century, the movies appeared. And in my opinion, we can trace certain cultural changes in the United States through the decades by assessing the movies. This single industry is easier to reach than the multiple number of newspapers, books, and magazines. And in seeking to discover when and why the media became an adversary of the Christian faith, and when and why the media decided that Christians in America represent a retrograde element. The movies today present just the blend of argument and appeal that we can use as a yardstick. For many years, the movies and the newspapers served to keep millions of Americans simultaneously informed about the great world and entertained. And it's a sad commentary on our educational system that these two inadequate sources served most Americans as their only vehicles of information. Therefore, I consider the movies until recent years with having been a part of the media and a basic part. They convey certain world views to the audience and they influence the way the people judge the world and one another. They are a shaping factor in popular culture, and this elevates their actual importance far beyond mere entertainment and into the higher categories of information and propaganda. They began, as you know, as Nickelodeons, situated in the heart of immigrant neighborhoods in metropolitan centers. And at first, they attracted mainly immigrant working-class audiences, both by their novelty and by their low price. They introduced cultural change on several levels. Years later, one American who lived through these effects said that in his hometown, the change meant closing the opera house, the center of local society, with its seats in the pit for the working class, and loges for the middle class, and balcony for the poor, into a movie house where everyone sat together. Some idea of the effect of such a change can be gained from the fact that in the beginning, the very idea of men and women, all strangers to one another, sitting together in the dark, seemed alarming. Cards were flashed on the screen, warning the women that the management would protect them. <laughs> when feature films appeared, however, middle-class people were drawn to the movies. 
They found that informality reigned to such an extent that no schedules were followed. Films were shown almost around the clock, and people were always either entering or leaving. And because most of the startup audiences for the movies were immigrants, it was decided at the beginning of the industry not to use sound. Instead, directors settled for pantomime and large gestures to convey significance. Subtitles were added, but these were often cursory. The eye-rolling emotions introduced another novelty, because the American middle class in those days did not believe in public displays of emotion. And at first, over half the feature-length films that entered the country, let us say in 1910, came from Europe. Many came from France and Italy, for it was in Italy that the great biblical spectacles were first created because the Pope had blessed the new technology as a vehicle to spread the faith. And since many of the new immigrants came from Mediterranean countries or from Catholic Ireland and southern Germany, many such films provided a considerable contrast with the dominant culture of Pro Protestant America. And that did not go unnoticed. Fears were expressed regarding the impact of both American and foreign films upon American manners and morals. The first screen kiss, for instance, created widespread shock and led to angry editorials in the newspapers and sermons from many, many pulpits. This and similar shocks led the Protestant middle class, which set the cultural tone for the nation at that time, to move toward control of the new medium. In 1908, the mayor of New York ordered the police to close all 500 of the movie houses for being open on Sunday. And not too long afterward, a national board of review was established to see that movies did not offend. And from then and for many years, movies were censored. Other measures of control included increased cost of licenses, regulations concerning where the films could be exhibited, the hours of exhibition, and so forth. And meanwhile, middle-class businessmen entered the industry. Their impact upon the type of films being shown was immediate and important. It might surprise you to learn that D.W. Griffith, the best known of these pioneers, now credited with introducing close-ups and various other techniques, did not actually invent any of those approaches, but he did use them with compelling skill. His great success actually stemmed from the Protestant nature of the films he produced and directed. Griffith reflected the tastes and the viewpoints of American middle class prior to World War I. He was fond, for instance, for what can only be termed morality plays in film. His 300 films were suffused with Christian imagery. His subtitles often quoted the Bible, and in his films the figure of Jesus would appear before repentant sinners. His films were respected and accepted. Some of his movies had the high honor, as it was then considered, of being shown in the White House. He corresponded with such personages as Woodrow Wilson and William Jennings Bryan. As the most successful filmmaker and director in the industry, he set a pattern that the others followed. In the process, certain stereotypes were established. For instance, the producers used young actors and actresses in part because they couldn't match the high prices of the stage. And this had the unintended effect of associating all progress with youth, all change with the young. Although history proves that progress and change is actually associated with people in every stage of life. And because the movies were associated from the onset with accusations of immorality, Griffith went to extraordinary efforts to portray women as secular saints. His most popular actress, Lillian Gish, 
was selected for her slenderness and her remarkable ability to portray unspoiled youth, and he made sure that the world learned that she was accompanied at all times by her mother. Griffith's great triumph and the beginning of his fall was the birth of a nation. He wrote Woodrow Wilson that he expected this film to help the president's re-election campaign. And certainly it reflected a southern view of the Reconstruction. It also revealed Griffith's deep-seated prejudice reflected in the fact that he used white actors and blackface to portray black people. The film was an enormous commercial success. It grossed over $13 million, a figure that today would represent well over $100 million, a very great, uh, very great sum at the time when a dollar a day was considered a good wage. The record lasted until 1934 in surface terms and even longer than that when we discount inflation. But the film also shattered the cultural consensus. The NAACP protested, as did many other groups, institutions, and individuals. Griffith was denounced as a racist, and riots occurred. And there are many media lessons in that event. One is that the films had proven to be an enormously powerful tool of propaganda. Another was that the film was too powerful to be allowed to express views with the candor that books had attained. Because after all, The Klansman, the book by Thomas Dixon upon which the film The Birth of a Nation was based, had caused no riots, aroused no demonstrations, and drew no censors. Griffith could not accept that distinction. He was infuriated at the uproar, and he considered himself the victim of intolerance masquerading as virtue, and determined to expose what he considered hypocrisy. He produced an enormous and costly extravaganza titled Intolerance. It ran for four hours. It cited Wilson, Emerson, and Mill in its subtitles, contained a long section dwelling on the authoritarian abuses of the Medicis, another on the priests of Baal, another on the Pharisees of Jerusalem at the time of Jesus. It ended in modern times, circa 1917 or whatever, perhaps a little later, and finally the millennium with a great luminous cross appearing in the sky that implied the arrival of the second coming. It was a commercial and financial fiasco. His illustrations were both too remote and too varied for the audience. They shrouded rather than revealed his argument. His career declined very rapidly after that, although during World War I he was still used to make patriotic films. His eclipse paralleled the end of the Protestant domination of the American popular movies and not only the movies. Popular literature post-World War I took on a decidedly new tone. Writers such as Hemingway, who said he no longer believed in the great words, honor, glory, patriotism, appeared. Scott Fitzgerald wrote a book casting a bootlegger as a hero, whose character was portrayed as better than the people of high society. Sinclair Lewis parodied small-town America, the Protestant ministry, and businessmen in a series of bestsellers. Virtuous heroes and heroines who never exchanged an erotic word vanished from American literature. Horatio Alger disappeared, excepting in second-hand stores. New American heroes appeared movie stars, athletes, even gangsters. This change was laid at the feet of the war and prohibition, but the United States had not conspicuously suffered in World War I. It had not lost nearly an entire leadership class as had Britain, France, and Germany. But the fact of World War I had wounded the West 
in more ways than the obvious. The self-styled Christian leaders could calmly send tens of millions of men to their deaths, revealed a hollowness on the top levels of Western civilization. World War I had revealed a pitiless, a religious, unchristian civilization no better than ancient Rome. And in the great wave of dissolution that washed across the West after World War I, Christianity appeared to many to have betrayed its congregation. The clergy offered no rationale for the debacle. It neither averted nor softened the tragedy nor bound up the wounds of the people afterward. The 1920s, therefore, became the first period since the so-called Age of Reason in which the literati, the stage, the press, the movies, all joined in subtly mocking both Christianity and its dwindling, dwindling in adherence. Mencken was admired for his Voltaire-like attacks against Christianity in what he contemptuously called the Bible Belt. Clarence Darrow became the nation's best-known attorney by defending murderous perverts in Chicago, and his anti-Christian sarcasms in the Stokes Evolution trial in Tennessee led to a national period of oblique Christian baiting, which helped hound William Jennings Bryan into an ignominious grave. Popular magazines and newspapers rejoiced at Mencken, adored Darrow, hailed Hemingway, saluted Sinclair Lewis, and radiated their values, or their loss of values. Similar changes swept through the movie industry. The Protestant businessmen in the movies gave way to Jewish producers and directors who found that by continuing their age-old practice of mutual cooperation, they could finance, produce, and direct films quickly and cheaply. And in a decade, they re reduced hundreds of competing films into eight large corporations, which they largely controlled. There was nothing esoteric or mysterious about this development. It reflected a shift or a series of shifts in cultural approaches conveyed by film in the business pattern of the film industry. The earlier approach had reflected the pre-war Protestant distrust of group societal activities, reflected in antipathy to labor unions and group political efforts. The progressives, for instance, had set up management boards, bipartisan elections, and civil service examinations. In the movie industry, they operated singly and competitively. But the new producers in the films believed in group politics and nepotistic business practices. They teamed with Irish Catholics who shared these beliefs, and consequently William Hayes became a symbol of respectability for the, for the industry. Jo joined by such financiers as Kennedy, the father of the future president, and Thomas Tumulty, the former president, the secretary, rather, of Woodrow Wilson, and William Gibbs McAdoo, former Secretary of Commerce who had married one of President Wilson's daughters. Hollywood became the center of an industry dominated by rising minorities whose attitudes and viewpoints were at variance with the older culture, but that were marvelously synchronized with the new post-war cultural fashions of urban America. In this new era, traditional patterns were upended. The Charleston and the Black Bottom, dances that originated in the black ghettos, together with short skirts, short hair, became mass fashions. Popular magazines and the daily press began to report scandals in promotional instead of censorious terms. A star system arose in which selected actors and actresses became cultural demigods for millions. The names are so familiar even after all these years that there's no point in going over them. 
The films in which these glittering new celebrities appeared replaced stories about captains of industry whose careers had once thrilled American youth with stories of work and success. And instead, movies appeared showing youth in rebellion against the stuffy standards of the past. Instead of evoking sympathetic laughter at the foibles of all society, the comedians mocked the entire middle class. Max Senate comedies popularized girls in bathing suits and made clowns out of the police. And for the first time in American history, American culture radiated sex, which was highlighted as the major element in all human activity. And for a while, of course, they respectabilized this by confining the sexual situation to the marital, which had the effect of denigrating marriage. These films were buttressed by others featuring the Wild West, in which the hard-working settlers and the rapidity with which they introduced schools and churches and farms and law and order were ignored, except as victims of gunmen, who in reality had been only a brief and unimportant fringe in the history of this nation. And in this manner, American history was distorted so deeply that the distortions remain in part as our national memory, while the truth remains largely unknown and dishonored. Nor was this historical truth all that was distorted. The radio introduced in the 20s and widespread in the 30s another element of fantasy to American popular culture. Marconi disgustedly declared that if he had known the uses to which his invention had been put, he would have destroyed it in the laboratory. The radio reinforced the movies and introduced the same crime dramas, the same popular stars, end quote, the same comedies that mocked class distinctions and authority, the same distortions of everyday life. Soap operas appeared, a magazine world of fiction and sound. Dr. Rush Dooney discussing this flight from, from reality in his book, The Word of Flux contrasted these fictions with the great role of man and his greatness even in defeat in classical literature. The radio, he said, and later television, keep man bathed in a dream world. In what they do not supply, his imagination does. In brief, modern man lives in a dream world, implicitly believing that reality is somehow or will be someday a part of man and totally at the command of man's imagination sometime. End quote. This was bad enough in the 30s when the media still paid lip service to virtue. Then gangsters died at the end of the gangster film, though they enjoyed life immensely until then. But the press began to report the real world as though it was an extension of the fictional world. Tabloids reported Pretty Boy Floyd, John Dillinger, and Dutch Schultz, and Al Capone as heroic figures, and even as modern Robin Hoods, and headlined their activities. Meanwhile, the 30s comedies in the middle of the Depression showed carefree heiresses and wealthy suitors entertaining people out of work, and the figure of the clergy dwindled to cameo appearances. Nevertheless, books still appeared in the 30s by writers such as the retired Lloyd C. Douglas, who wrote Christian-oriented bestsellers, and Bud Schulberg was able to satirize Hollywood in What Makes Sammy Run Without Being Persecuted for Candor. Bing Crosby could appear as a priest without creating any laughter. And the newspapers still cited clergymen with considerable respect. And large church denominations could still command the awe of aspiring politicians. But the damage done to the clergy by Sinclair Lewis's novel Elmer Gantry and by other lapoons sank deep. The stage, the radio, and the press 
interchangeable elements in the communications sector where reality and fantasy began to intermingle in the minds of millions kept most Americans from believing even in the reality of the war in Europe until we were catapulted into the conflict by the Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor. And the fact that Pearl Harbor came as a surprise in that to this day most Americans don't understand the motivations of Tokyo is striking evidence of how poor a job the press did, the media did, in keeping the nation informed of world events and world trends. But the media by then had become a shaping, a shaping force rather than an informational belt. The media in all its aspects, newspapers, mag magazines, radio, films, had learned that serious discussions did not draw large crowds or mass circulation. The press had learned the celebrity game and had hounded the Lindberghs out of the country because they tried to maintain some decent privacy in the midst of a family tragedy. And the press had also learned, through a charismatic President Roosevelt, that politics could be reported as a form of a contest almost like intellectual athletics. Therefore, who won and who lost on what issues became more important to report than the substance of the issue. Events were overshadowed by the personalities involved. Larger significance was set aside in favor of close-ups of people. And what was equally significant was that many of the people assembled by President Roosevelt were new people from minority backgrounds, from the universities, who replaced what New Deal historian Schlesinger called, with some disdain, the old order. There was, in other words, a cultural revolution, a change in the social order, and in the process, religion, for the first time in American history, became a shadowy private sector. The days of Mencken and his blast ended, but what replaced such attacks was indifference, silence. At the time, of course, this was not as obvious as it appears in retrospect, because for a time, World War II carried all other subjects before it. And as long as that conflict remained undecided, the American press reported it patriotically. But the goals of the struggle were confused from the onset by the fact that we allied ourselves with one dictator in the name of fighting all dictators. Our government and our media denied the reality of Stalin's role in the Soviet Union, and this dishonesty remained embedded to an amazing extent in our media today. The persecution of Christianity and Christians in the Soviet Union and in its satellite is persistently ignored or downplayed by our press, film, radio, magazines, and television. The same silence is drawn over the persecution of Christianity and Christians in Turkey, in Red China, in Nicaragua, in Cuba, in Mexico and in other parts of the world. One result of that dishonesty in World War II was that the goals of the war grew confused. Toward its close, our newspaper men began to work over and debate generals they didn't like, like General Patton, one of our most effective leaders who became the result of a great campaign because of minor incidents which occur in all armies. General MacArthur became the target of a sustained campaign of denigration unique in our history. His very success appeared to infuriate American journalists. But it's the post-war, post-war two period in which we live today that produced the greatest changes of all. Changes that none of us foresaw, that nobody predicted, and that very few intelligently 
combated. The injuries suffered by Christianity in World War I were minor compared to the blows it received in post-World War II. Standards of decency vanished. Hitler's Nazis create committed atrocities against millions, but so did our allies in the Soviet Union. Indignation is expressed by every element of the West against the massacres of Jews, but far less attention is paid to the massacres of Christians. I do not say this to underestimate the suffering nor to deny the Jewish Holocaust. But I do say that silence about the persecutions of Christians is a strange and indecent contrast. How is it possible to dismiss the deaths of millions relatively as relatively unimportant compared to anything or anyone? And of course the events in Europe were not unprecedented. The Muslim Turks massacred several million Christian Armenians, and the world remained silent. Since World War II, the communist government of Peking has supervised the genocide of the Tibetan people, and hardly a word of commiseration is uttered, even by clergymen. In fact, these atrocities against Jews, against Christians, Tibetans, Armenians in our century, in our time, have been paralleled by the most sinister intellectual development seen since the birth of Christendom. We have witnessed the rise of an anti-Christian campaign that not only enveloped Germany in the 30s and the USSR since 1917, and not only Cuba, Nicaragua, Vietnam, China, and Eastern Europe since, but one that has emerged inside the United States as well. It began, as we have already seen, in a growing contempt that slowly changed into indifference by the 1940s. Then, after World War II, attacks against Christianity arose in Europe because it was said of Hitler. He was credited with being the product of Christianity. The Nazis were said to be the heirs of Christendom. That charge has floated through the West like a cloud of poison gas. It is troubling and divisive. It is certainly not repeated by anyone of conscience, but there are many bitter residues from World War II, and bitterness will seek any outlet. That the charge is false is hardly worth saying, but that the charge appeared and was not answered is shameful. It betrays a weakness in Christian spokesmen that is difficult to respect. This is especially so since the charge has subtly crept into the popular culture to denigrate the Christian presence in our society and to credit it with bigotry and prejudice. As in all such charges, it is difficult, if not impossible, to ascertain its origin, and equally difficult not to believe that it was floated and is promoted by the forces of atheism and anti-Christianity, by the cleverest propagandists in our time in the Kremlin, who are both anti-Semitic and anti-Christian, but whatever its origin, it floats among us today to poison the national dialogue. The fact that this noxious charge has not been openly discussed is proof in itself of how weak Christianity and Christians have become in the post-war period. Today, an anti-Christian play is no longer a novelty. An anti-Christian book is no longer a matter of surprise. Dramas portraying corrupt and hypocritical Christian clergymen appear daily on our television. And one sees in this progression a steady development from an isolated intellectual charge to finally a flood of popular level anti-Christian slanders, fictions, and portrayals in the name of entertainment. In the meantime... 
The boards that once censored movies have slowly disappeared. A rating system appeared in which the movie industry promised to discipline itself. The contemporary novel reads as though it was designed for sale in the anteroom of a brothel. The detective fiction reeks with the fantasies of torturers. Nudity now appears in magazines, on stage, and in film cassettes. The press, under the guise of information, echoes similar themes. We have children who cannot tell the difference between television specials and actual crimes committed in front of them. Journalists whose preconceptions blind them to what they actually see and hear, and audiences ignorant of the world beyond their television set. The overall peril of such a situation is difficult to exaggerate. Disdain is the word for the media and its response, its attitude to Christians and Christianity. And the very use of the word Christian in the public sector has been attacked as injurious to the nation's health. Such a thing has never before been said about any people. No group of people before have ever been told that they shouldn't publicly identify themselves, lest they offend by being alive. All these charges, sinister to freedom, to reason, to our sacred beliefs, echoed without reproof in the media, illustrated on our television, voiced on the radio, printed in newspapers, articled in magazines, promoted at length in books, affect the courts. Mr. Dooley says the courts can read the newspapers. They still do. Distortions of Christianity and the cause of revolution, therefore, have moved a long way. The observation of my fellow journalists that there is no Christianity in the media is an error. The media is suffused with slanders against Christianity, with mocking parodies, with insults. And we've seen America shift from its proud position at the beginning of the century, confident of its future, proud of its past, into a land where the majority is treated with contempt. But that time is drawing to a close. Later we will discuss the Christian response to this long period of bigotry and prejudice. Thank you very much.